Well, um, I want to say uh, it's a pleasure for me to be up here. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the youth pastor here. My name is Luke, and we're in the middle of a sermon series on questions. And I love these kind of things. Um, I was trained in apologetics, Christian apologetics, where there's a lot of interfaith dialogue and um, a, a, kind of a rigorous atmosphere, but a relational atmosphere too. And uh, the question that we've set for ourselves this morning has to do with uh, the cross. And the title of my sermon I've selected is The Cross, Tragic End or New Beginning. Um, there's really no one question, um, but it involves powerful objections, perhaps, uh, from those who may not consider themselves Christians, um, such as, why did an innocent man have to die? How, in what way is this for other people's sins? And what does that have to do with me? And, you know, if you're here as, as Christians, uh, then I encourage you to listen and to receive it, and to receive what I will say in a way that is, I hope it better equips you to participate in the mystery of the cross. Um, I hope not to just communicate facts or information, but really to provide us with a, another way in which we can appreciate what it is that our faith is centered on. And if you're here as an inquirer too, then I, I appreciate your presence as well. The, the Bible says as, as one person sharpens iron, or as iron sharpens iron, so does one person sharpen another. That uh, we are benefited and we are edified and we are lifted up by the presence of others who can challenge us, who may not always think the same way as we do, but who, with whom we can speak and dialogue with in love. So um, there's a context for this whole question, and it is something of a strange mystery that perhaps as Christians we're so close to that we take for granted. You know, how is it that this the unwarranted and bloody execution of this Middle Eastern carpenter turned rabbi and healer could have found its way to the center of Christian life and doctrine. Now, we have a lot to cover this morning, and some of it's going to be more intellectual if you can want to look at it that way, but again, it's always keep it very practically minded that this relates to how we live our lives. And um, I'm reminded of the verse that says, unless the Lord build the house, they that uh, build it labor in vain. So uh, I think we should submit this to the feet of Christ and uh, pray over the message this morning. And I will be praying, since it is a topic of a question and a discourse, uh, a student's prayer that was written many centuries ago. Come, Holy Spirit, divine creator, true source of light and fountain of wisdom, pour forth your brilliance upon my dense intellect, dissipate the darkness which covers me, that of sin and ignorance. Grant me a penetrating mind to understand, a retentive memory, method and ease in learning, the lucidity to comprehend, and abundant grace in expressing myself. Guide the beginning of my work, direct its progress, and bring it to successful completion. This I ask through Jesus Christ, true God and true man, living and reigning with you in the Father forever and ever. Amen. All right, so uh, it's an understatement to say that the cross is paradoxical in many ways. So for those who are looking at Christianity from the outside, it may seem as if Christians have got everything backwards or upside down. And we ought to be focused on the life and the teachings of Jesus, rather than what brought all of that to a sudden and gruesome halt. Or surely his life and not his death was a, the gift to humanity. Why is, this, why is there this morbid fascination with this ancient instrument of torture? Why do we adorn our churches with it, rather than some other symbol of Jesus? Why the cross? Now, what we first have to realize about this line of questioning is that, as intuitive to our minds as it may seem, it presupposes that this whole business about Jesus dying for sins is something added on later to the teachings of Jesus and to the consciousness of the community of His followers. On this basis, we would expect the Gospels and the letters of the New Testament, if they mention the shameful event of the cross at all, to do so reluctantly and certainly without any positive association. But of all the things, when we actually take to reading what these people wrote of their experiences, we get the uncanny feeling that everything Christ said 
or did somehow was leading him exactly to that cross. So let's begin in kind of framing the question and establishing some context to considering some of the names that the New Testament gives for Jesus. This isn't an exhaustive list, but on the screen behind me you'll see a few of these. Um, There are names used like Savior, Lamb, Redeemer, High Priest, Messiah, Son of Man, Son of God, Lord, Bread of Life, Temple, The New Adam, Shepherd, Ransom, Light of the World. Someone from First Service encouraged me to include Kinsman Redeemer. So Kinsman Redeemer is another one. Uh, Now, most, if not all, of these titles, despite their varied meanings, they share in a common trajectory. These are titles of power, they're titles of authority, they're titles of their life-giving titles. But there's also a sacrificial element to many of these titles. And when understood together, we might say that they refer to one who would establish a fundamentally new order achieved through intercessory sacrifice. I'll say that one more time. They refer to someone who would establish a new order, a fundamentally new order that was achieved through intercessory sacrifice. You could also consider perhaps the most well-known Bible verse of all time. Many people who are not Christians at all in any sense of the word are familiar with this passage. If I began it, almost all of you in the room could complete it for me. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That's John 3.16. Now, at first you might ask, what does this passage have to do with dying? Well, what we don't always catch is that the context of this meaning in which the giving of the Son is intended. So if we look just before that in the passage, Jesus states, this is the verse right before, Jesus says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in Him. Now there's not a lot of time to get into exactly what that reference is, but Jesus is making a comparison to an Old Testament narrative. When the Israelites were being uh, delivered out of Egypt by Moses, they were in the wilderness. And when they were in the wilderness, there were wild snakes that had invaded the camp. And they were biting people and poisoning people, and people were dying. So as people were dying, they were crying out to God, saying, God, deliver us from this, give us some, some help. And what God instructed was that a bronze serpent would be crafted and put on top of a pole, and that pole hoisted up in the middle of the camp. And the simple direction was, anyone who was to look on that pole and gaze on the serpent, if they'd been bitten, they would be healed. So, you have this idea that in the midst of God's people, a poison that has infected the blood of His people is remedied for those who direct their focus and their attention onto, in this case, the serpent that was raised up. But you can see the notion of being raised up and lifted up so that everyone who believes may have eternal life is a forecasting of the cross itself. So the believing in Jesus, so that you don't perish but have eternal life, is directly connected by Christ himself to the cross. So truly, that centrality of his sacrifice was not a later addition. It was not some idiosyncratic obsession of some of his more vocal disciples. It formed the very heart of the Christian community. Now, one of the early church figures named Tertullian Um, It described the Christian life and the Christian community this way. This was about the year 200 that he wrote. But he's talking about what Christians do, what Christians do in their daily affairs. And he says, at every forward step and movement, at every going in and out, when we put on our clothes and shoes, when we bathe, when we sit at table, when we light lamps, on couch, on seat, in all the ordinary actions of daily life, we trace upon the forehead the sign of the cross. Now, this affirms that same principle which Paul expressed in his letters to various churches. Now, he reminds them with a refreshing brevity. He says uh, to the church in Corinth, he says, For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So he's talking about when I first was with you guys and setting this church up, and this is your identity. He said, "If, if you guys don't know anything else, if you forget everything I say, know this, the person of Jesus Christ and the miracle of the, the loaves, the wedding at Cana, those are all important details. 
But it wasn't those things. It wasn't any particular miracle of his life. It wasn't any particular teaching even of his life. It was his cross. It was him crucified. In the church uh, in Galatia, he says, God forbid that I should boast of anything but the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you have uh, up there on the screen behind me, it might be difficult for some of you to see it, but it's a, um, a rendering, um, an old like diagram of sorts, of church architecture. So it didn't take too long before Christians actually had the chance to start building churches, but after they were being persecuted and they had churches in people's houses, they had the opportunity to actually build them. Um, that they adopted the cruciform pattern for the church. So as you can see, it's like the uh, central kind of aisle here. We almost have it mirrored with our little lane running uh, along this way. That the very church itself, if viewed from the top down, would have been like Christ himself crucified. And the fascinating thing is that the pulpit is more or less where the throat would be. And, uh, and even in our church, we have this, this structure here too, is that the, the altar would be almost invariably where the heart would be. So that is that from out of which we celebrate communion, and that from out of which we recognize and participate in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is at the very heart of the cross of Jesus Christ himself. So fascinating elements. The cross wove its way into daily life, into things like architecture and the arts, and, and every which way. And if we work our way back even to the very words of Jesus, we find him after his death and resurrection. He's on the road to Emmaus, and this is, this is great. Jesus has a sense of humor. You know this. Because he's on the road to Emmaus. Now, uh, this is after his resurrection, but his disciples, some of the disciples don't know it yet. So he's, he starts walking up with some of his disciples on the road, and they don't recognize him. That's the weird thing. Is they, something different about him. They just can't c connect. And so he starts saying, oh, uh, what's been going on lately, guys? You know, what's the, what's the news? And uh, they say, what, are you living under a rock for the last couple of weeks? It's like Jesus, this whole Jesus thing, and there was a whole uproar, and there were, you know, guards, and he was crucified, and it's this horrible thing, you know? And then he's, you know, just saying, oh, tell me more about this Jesus guy. And uh, finally, you know, they express that sort of, they're lamenting how this is like a failure, and it's, it's a tragedy. And then he, he interrupts them, and he says, he said to them, how foolish you are. And how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Didn't he have to do it? So from the perspective of Jesus himself, it was necessary. And again, this painting up here you'll see is by William Holman Hunt, who's a pre-Raphaelite painter, and it's the shadow of death is its name. And what it depicts is uh, Jesus, and he's, as he's a carpenter and he's in his shop, and his mother Mary is down there to his side, and she's actually looking into the uh, chest with the gifts of the Magi that he was given as a child. And he perhaps is open to some interpretation, but he's either stretching or he's, he's sort of looking up to the heavens. And Mary is, is frightened, and she's, she's scared by this, this shadow that is cast over and against the wall, the wall where the nails and the carpenter's tools are being hung. It's the shadow of, of the image uh, of a man hanging, as it were, on there. So there's this idea captured in that painting, which is very brilliant and beautiful, that the cross was, the, from the very beginning, Jesus understood where his mission would, would terminate, where it was going to end. And he, he continued, and it was only given a little foreshadows, perhaps, to other people, but he knew from the outset, and his eyes are cast up to the Father, it's, it's a very powerful painting. Now, while this event, the cross, the crucifixion, seems to have been on the mind of Jesus and the early Christians, and somehow not as an embarrassing detail, but as the crowning achievement of Jesus, we shouldn't diminish the fact that it has proven a great stumbling block to the world for the last 2,000 years. Uh, one modern figure expressed some reservation, not as negative as, as others you'll see in a second, but uh, some reservation about the cross. He says, I could accept Jesus as a martyr, an embodiment of sacrifice, and a divine teacher, but not as the most perfect man ever born. His death on the cross was a great example to the world, but that there was anything like a mysterious or miraculous virtue in it, my heart could not accept. And that was a young Gandhi who wrote that. So to his credit, Gandhi saw something very noble and very virtuous, but he couldn't go to the point where he said, this is, this is the work of a perfect, a perfect man, that there is something miraculous and something that changes the whole world because of this. And you'll also notice up here, um, 
I brought lots of visual aids today, that this uh, is a more, going back to about the second century, about 200, this is a bit of graffiti, actually, that was found on Roman ruins. And what the text says, uh, so it's a little guy there, uh, off to the left, and then it's, if you, you can see there's a cross shape, and there's a figure on it, and the figure has the head of a, of a horse, or if you're probably reading into it, the head of an ass, because the text says, uh, Aloximenos worships his god. So this was around the year 200, they're guessing, that at this point, this was sort of the, a pagan bit of graffiti that was scattered on a thing that was mocking this Christian guy, Aloximenos, that, oh, he's worshiping this, this great fool, this great, um, you know, someone who's made, made a great fool of himself and who thinks he's god, and, and how ridiculous is that? So uh, we see that from the pagan perspective, that this was on the Christian's minds, but definitely not a pagan idea. Uh, another quote from a more modern time that's very antagonistic is from Nietzsche. Uh, he writes this about Jesus. This saintly anarchist who aroused the people of the abyss, the outcasts and the sinners, to rise in revolt against the established order of things was certainly a political criminal, at least insofar as it was possible to be one in so absurdly unpolitical a community. This is what brought him to the cross. The proof thereof is to be found in the inscription that was put on the cross. He died for his own sins. There's not the slightest ground for believing, no matter how often it is asserted, that he died for the sins of others. And that was Nietzsche from uh, a book called The Antichrist. So he sort of is not really being subtle about his opinions when it comes to that. But the funny thing is, I find it fascinating, and this is just a small selection of, of objections, but I find it fascinating that the disciples of Jesus, they weren't naively and blindly supportive of the idea of the cross. They weren't uh, fin like uh, expressing a bl blind fanaticism about it. They understood that it looked foolish. They could relate because before they came to accept it as their saving hope, all of them had been skeptics. All of them had abandoned Jesus. As their rabbi hung there dying, they themselves had thought all that was lost. So they'd walked through that before. They understood that it seemed impossible to believe that anything good could come from that. Paul echoes this in his letter to the Corinthians. He says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and a folly to the Gentiles. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And unless we should think that Paul is taking some abstract doctrine as an opportunity to ride his high horse, recall what accepting the cross meant for him in his own life. It meant the, meant the complete abandonment of his pride and the admission that he had been a great and terrible enemy of God for so much of his life. In his letter to Timothy, as he's encouraging Timothy, he tells him, This Timothy is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. So, with this bit of context from Jesus and the early church on the centrality of the cross, we can move forward briefly to consider several approaches for helping us make sense of this colossal claim that Jesus sacrificed himself to atone for the sins of the world. Now, it's going to help to first address what sin means in the New Testament, because that term itself is even a difficult one in our society. It's not commonly agreed on or accepted or understood. Um, the New Testament actually has five words that are used for sin. Uh, there's one that's very common that we're, some of us might be more familiar with. The first one that is the most common is hamartia which is the missing of the mark uh, word. So it's like an archery term that if you were aiming at a, a target, and even if you don't get, you know, quite on the bullseye, you're just a little bit off, that's still missing the mark. So missing the mark broadly just means imperfection, but it can cover a whole range of things. But there are other terms that catch different elements of what sin implies. Another term is adikia, which can be translated unrighteousness or iniquity. So there's an element to that about uh, some kind of turning against an inherent moral voice in your heart. 
Or poneria, which is even a little bit further, which is evil of a vicious or degenerate kind. So you can think of something that's very warped and disturbed and perverse or something like that. Parabasis means a trespass or a transgression. So there's this idea that there's been a line drawn in the sand and that you're pushing up against it or you're trying to cross over. There's territory that you're walking into that you don't have a right to be in. One of the last big ones is anomia, uh, without law, lawlessness. So it's disregard or violation of a known law. So there's a legal aspect there, and that becomes important as we'll be looking at some of the ways to see the cross. So we should keep in mind that our understanding of the cross should make sense of all of these different senses of sin and try and reconcile what's being said with those definitions. Lastly, before we dive into these different viewpoints, um, the, one of the most influential Christian passages uh, in understanding the atonement uh, or what happened at the cross comes from the book of Isaiah. Uh, me, almost every single early church figure came up against this, and the passage that I'm going to read from you, uh, for you uh, from Isaiah is, can be basically assembled if you take quotes of it from the New Testament. So it's, the entirety of the passage ends up getting quoted all throughout the New Testament. Now this is an image in Isaiah 53 that is created, Isaiah being a book of prophecy, about a mysterious figure called the suffering servant. Um, and the idea is that this figure, who we're not 100% sure where he's supposed to come in, in terms of Isaiah, but he is going to suffer a great deal. He's going to be uh, scorned, and yet somehow, in a weird way, his pains are going to be connected with our benefit. His pains are going to be associated with our healings. So from Isaiah 53, the key text is this. Surely he, the suffering servant, took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, if some of you have had um, more of a, a Christian education, especially within the Protestant tradition, it's likely that your main model for approaching the cross is going to be the one that's been popularized by Reformation figures like Martin Luther and John Calvin. Uh, this framework is commonly referred to as penal substitution. Uh, now, to kind of capture the gist of this model, it describes the dilemma of life, however we understand that. We know that it's a broken world out there, that evil things happen, that order is not always observed, that there's chaos. That dilemma is couched in a courtroom terminology. So God, being our creator, is the source of a properly moral life. He's our moral law giver. But since humanity, corporately and individually, as a group and by ourselves, we've chosen not just to seek fulfillment outside of God, but to actively rebel against His moral order through intentionally evil acts, things like lying, cheating, stealing, abusing others, murder, jealousy, hatred, we stand lawfully condemned before the divine and eternal judge of the universe. God cannot de deny His justice or he wouldn't be God, if God sort of acted as though the complete act of rebellion against him were nothing, then he would himself be a God of chaos. So he can't deny his justice, nor, uh, but, and therefore the just punishment for rebellion against the giver of life is death. But he is also love itself, so he does not desire that we should come to destruction. So what does God do? It sounds like God's in a dilemma. Well. He himself, in the person of his Son, takes our place as a representative of all humanity and bears our punishment. So he makes a legal atonement. And that's where the name comes from. It's penal substitution. Christ is put in our place to suffer a punishment that we legally were, were bound to. And Martin Luther, um, in his characteristically intense way, he puts it like this. He says, Now no one, not even an angel of heaven, could appease the eternal wrath of God, which we merited by our sins, except that eternal person, the Son of God Himself. And He could do it only by taking our place, assuming our sins, and answering for them as though He Himself were guilty of them." It's pretty intense. Now this framework makes sense of the language that's used in many places throughout the New Testament. 
uh, book of Colossians says, when you, were, when you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all of our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, and He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Or you could turn to 1 Peter 2. He Himself bore our sins in His body on the cross, so that you might die to sins and live for righteousness. By His wounds you've been healed. That's Him quoting Isaiah. Or, or Galatians 3. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. And lastly, God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us. This is, we're going to come back to this one. To be sin for us so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. So, in recent times, penal substitution has come under a lot of criticism uh, on the grounds that it portrays an angry God who has a very hard time with forgiveness and who has a warped view of justice. And it's important as Christians to take these criticisms uh, into account and, and to respect the objections because oftentimes we ourselves, uh, it's very easy to misrepresent God. Um, and it's hard to picture some of the courtroom metaphors where they fall short. So, for example, we can more easily picture someone, if I owe a massive fine and I have no way I'm ever going to pay it, we can more easily picture the virtue of someone coming in and saying, hey, Luke, you know, I, I, just take this. It's a free gift. I'm paying it off. You're free to go. That's a more equitable picture than a judge condemning a murderer and saying, you're, you're guilty of murder. The charge is death. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make it all right because I'm going to take this innocent guy over here, and I'm going to put him in your place, and you can just walk outside. If, if that's exactly how it looks, then if that happened in society, we would cry it's an outrage. We would say that that's, that's, that's not justice at all. So, again, the courtroom metaphor has its limitations, um, and it's hard to, to picture, because in the case of Jesus, it's the judge himself who steps in <laughs> to bear the sentence, and he assumes our very humanity so he takes on all the sins of all times, whereas human courtrooms, they deal with external crimes on a case-by-case -case basis. So again, we have to be careful about the ways in which we understand the courtroom metaphor. And also, I think it's very important to make a note on the language of wrath, because again, this is one in which many conversations I've had with, with people, and there's a, there's a ground to it. See, it just seems like God is really angry. <laughs> you know, I'm like, why is he so angry? Uh, where's the love part? Um, we have to be ca cautious about that language uh, because in human affairs, and you can, guys can correct me if you've ever experienced wrath without wrong emotions attached to it, but wrath is almost always accompanied by the wrong emotional disposition. So if I said, I'm just so full of fury and wrath, you, that almost always is going to mean that I am overreacting to something, that I am giving myself over to, uh, to something, I've lost control a little bit. And of course, that associating that with God would be improper. Um, that's why I think sensible theologians from the early days until now, they were actually aware of this difficulty. So if you go back to a figure like Origen, that's back to the first couple centuries, he says, for ourselves, however, whenever we read of the anger of God, whether in the Old Testament or new, we do not take such statements literally, but look for the spiritual meaning in them, endeavoring to understand them in a way that is worthy of God. Now again, this isn't Origen saying the scriptures mean whatever I want them to mean. He's saying, don't don't take it as you literally would if someone on the street was talking to you about wrath and how I'm filled with wrath. You have to understand it as you would try and apply it towards God. Or Emil Brunner, who's a more contemporary theologian, he puts it in another way. He says, the wrath of God is the love of God. The wrath of God is the love of God in the form in which the man who is turned away from God and, uh, and turned against him experiences it. So in other words, God doesn't change his mind. God isn't a schizophrenic. God isn't here, there, and, and everywhere. God is love itself. But the love of God is so powerful that when you have separated yourself from it in your life, your, the, your idea of God, uh, it will appear to you as, as a judgment. It will appear, rather than, than healing, it will appear to you as a condemnation. So regarding penal substitution then, it's my opinion this model is a crucial one. It's essential. But I do believe that modern Christians do themselves a disservice by remaining unaware of other 
models which complement it. I don't think any of the things we're going to talk about are at loggerheads to each other. I think there's a complementary view that you can have. And it comes from our tradition uh, that helps to understand God's uh, redemptive activity in history. So if we'll jump uh, back a little bit more in history, we're kind of working our way backwards. Um, there's another view which came to be known as satisfaction theory. And, and this, again, this can be very helpful because if there's people in life that have only ever heard of one conception and, they've, and it's been the grounds for their objection, like, I just don't get how an angry God can't just forgive us or how God is going to condemn me all the time. These are ways in which we can speak through those barriers and through those obstacles. So I think this is a tremendous gift. Uh, satisfaction theory was produced by Anselm of Canterbury. Um, and it, what he does is he shifts the emphasis from the forensic terminology, this legal kind of stuff. There's the law, you're a violator, you're a criminal, there's punishment, um, to that of God's honor and dignity. So it's related but different. So the main point here, to summarize him, is that we dishonor God through sin. Being created by him, already we owe him everything we are, right? Got all of your being, all of your life, all of your everything comes from God. So what do you owe him? All of it, okay. Now, sin makes things impossibly difficult, though, because once we sin, now it's as if we owe God everything and then some. As Anselm puts it, if in justice I owe God myself and all my powers, even when I do not sin, I have nothing left to render him for my sin. So essentially, sin introduces imbalance into the universe. When we've deprived God of his outward honor and are unable to restore it, it makes the world seem like a lawless and disordered place, like God himself can't even get his own honor. What's going to happen with our human society and what's going to happen with the, our families and communities? And that's for this reason humanity began a downward descent of dishonoring not only God, but abusing each other and the entire creation. So according to Anselm, the death of Jesus on the cross remedies this because only one who is innocent could have the possibility of offering God something which was not already owed. That's his life. So an innocent one is necessary. But it's also necessary that someone be infinite because only an infinite person can provide an offering worthy of the infinite God. So innocence and infinity. Jesus, by making an innocent act of infinite love, restores the proper honor due to God, bringing him satisfaction. Now the word satisfaction, the Latin word for satisfaction is just, satis just means enough. He brings sufficient honor back to God. Because he did this as a man, Jesus, he shares with us the merits of such a noble and worthy sacrifice. And this includes a renewed relationship with God the Father and the promises of eternal life. So, satisfaction theory, a slightly different way of seeing it. Rolling back even more in history, we have an idea that's been called, or a set of ideas that have come to be known as ransom theory. Uh, now, this was before even the time of Anselm. This was a popular view among the early church figures. Less of a theory, more of a helpful image, but um, we find its basis in passages from Scripture such as the following. Jesus says, Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Or in 1 Timothy, for there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. So this one's pretty, this is kind of interesting. So the central idea here is that in rebelling against God, what we've in, in essence done is sold ourselves over to the forces of the world, of whom the devil is chief. So we've basically, as the scriptures say themselves, we're slaves to sin. We have given ourselves over. We have turned our back on God, and we are now stuck, and we're like, as it were, sold into slavery. So we're slaves to sin, and God, desiring that we should be his again, couldn't just take us from the devil, because we're kind of his property now, and God is just. So this is a different kind of way of seeing things, is that the devil kind of owns us, and God can't just steal us from the devil. So he has to, in a funny way, to put it casually, outswindle the swindler. That's what God has to do now. So how God did this, how God tricks the devil into kind of allowing us to be redeemed back, he allowed himself to be incarnate as a man in Jesus so that the devil would be lured in to attack him. And there's a cool metaphor that you're going to see in this picture. Um, the devil is lured to attack him, which he did, but the devil had no right to do so with Jesus like he did with us. See, we had sold ourselves over to sin. The devil owns us. Jesus was an innocent man. 
Jesus being perfectly innocent, and the devil, when he orchestrated the murder of this innocent man, forfeits his legal right to humanity, and now we're ransomed back into God's family. So this is a picture that is, uh, suggests this idea. That, uh, the devil is described as a ravenous fish by one of these um, early church figures, Gregory of Nyssa. Gregory puts it this way. God, in order to secure that the ransom in our behalf might be easily accepted, the devil's lured in, by the devil who required it, was hidden under the veil of our nature, so that, as with a ravenous fish, the hook of the deity might be gulped down along with the bait of the flesh, and thus, life being introduced into the house of death, the devil might vanish. So basically, the devil is tricked into falsely attacking Jesus, and then, he, then life is introduced into the territory of death, and death loses all claim on our humanity. Now, ransom theory is very interesting, and, they, and there's other writings that, that uh, reflect this. Um, and it has its weaknesses too. So Anselm criticized it because he said simply, well, God owes the devil nothing but punishment. So Anselm was convinced uh, that eh, this is giving the devil a little bit too much credit. The devil doesn't really own us. Um, but nonetheless, I think that's a fair criticism, but this does provide us a healthy kind of model to approach the concept of what a ransom would mean for Christ's sacrifice. Last uh, model that we're gonna look at before we just, again, try and bring it into our hearts and, and bring it into our lives. Um, is a model that has been called Christus Victor. And this is just a name that a 20th century theologian gave it. But its roots go back to the early church. And the key focus here is that Jesus utterly overpowered, it basically means Christ victorious, he utterly overpowered every negative and dark and wicked spiritual force of the world on the cross. And so you're going to notice in just the quotes I'm going to read that uh, uh, certain words are used repeatedly, and one of those words is corruption. Corruption, corruption, corruption. When we hear that word corruption, we usually think of moral corruption. So we think of, oh, those cor the corrupt politicians or corrupt businessmen, you know, this sort of behind the scenes immoral, you know, activity. That would have been understood by the early church, but they had a much deeper dimension to it as well. So for them, corruption meant um, even to the level of like physical decay and entropy. So death itself had to do with corruption. So if you think of like food going bad, you know, it's like, it's that idea that was built into that. So corruption is a very loaded word um, when these guys are using it. So Athanasius, who's one of my favorites, his name literally means immortal one. So I, I'm not sure if he got that name after he was a Christian or not, but it would make sense. Uh, <laughs> um, but it's just such a cool name. Uh, he wrote a work on the incarnation of Christ. And here, it's interesting because he's talking about the question that comes up, why can't God just forgive the sins? Why, what is God's big hang-up? You know, why, can't God just, we've made a mistake, and can't God just say, you've repented, that's enough? Well, he actually addresses that. And his issue is this. He says, nor does repentance recall man from what is natural, but it merely halts sins. So in other words, repentance will heal that relational kind of part, or it'll stop sins for the time being until you sin again. But it doesn't recall men from what is natural. He says, if there were only offense and not the consequence of corruption, repentance would have been fine. So in other words, if leaving God and going our own way and severing ourselves from the author of life, if all that meant was God was, there was some offense, then repentance would have been enough. But it means a heck of a lot more than that. It means something that worked its way, death itself worked its way into the very core of our being, and something has to get that out. So that's why he says, if once the transgression had taken off, human beings were now held fast in natural corruption, everybody gets old and gets sick and dies, we're liable to false desires and passions, and we're deprived of the grace of being in the image, what else needed to happen? Athanasius asked that question. And according to Athanasius, again, if all that happened through sin was offense, repentance would have been enough. But because we've severed our link through sin to the one who holds the key of eternal life, <laughs> eternal life, <laughs> caffeine, um, eternal life, eternal life, that's, that's in the other place. That's definitely in the other place. <laughs> um, we fade away. We're fading away physically and morally. So how then does Jesus at the cross remedy the situation? Well, in a different sense than Martin Luther used it, uh, Jesus became sin. And again, that's a tricky passage. We don't want to say that Jesus just became evil. So in what sense did he become sin? Well, uh, this is Maximus the Confessor, is another figure. He says, he's very careful. 
the Lord did not know my sin, that is, the unreliability of my free choice, neither did he assume or become my sin. So Jesus didn't become a liar, a cheater, or whatever, you know, all the things that we do. Rather, he became the sin that I caused in terms of corruptibility and mortality. So he took on that deep darkness that we brought into the universe, that, that death and entropy are now here with us. And he submitted voluntarily to the condemnation owed me in my nature, even though he himself was blameless. Accordingly, that's the therefore, he has driven sin, passion, and corruption, and death from human nature. So it's almost like an exorcism. There's this idea of driving out. He said he submitted to it, it did its best against him, and he's pushed it out. Back to Athanasius, he says, Jesus took from us our bodily nature. He delivered it over to death on behalf of all. He offered it to the Father, doing this for love in human beings, that all of us dying with him, the law concerning corruption might be undone. And this is the kicker. Its power, corruption's power, was fully expended in the lordly body and no longer has any grounds against similar human beings. It's a silly comparison, but... Uh, some of us, you've seen the, the Rocky Balboa movies, you know? It's like, yeah, Rocky 9000, when he, he's, like, he's like 88 years old. And he's, yeah, but, yeah, the Rocky movies, they have the same theme, right? Because um, it's always about discipline and perseverance. But the idea of how Rocky wins the fight, how does Rocky win the fight? He gets destroyed for the first, like, eight rounds. I mean, like, he just gets pummeled and pummeled and pummeled, and yet he doesn't fall down, he doesn't fall down. And then finally, when the other guy has just punched himself out, and he's tired like this, then Rocky comes back, you know, and then he finishes the other guy off. So uh, it's a silly kind of comparison, but it's, it's kind of getting at what these guys are doing, is they're saying that death itself, corruption, came after Jesus, and it came after him, and it came after him. It says life was here, and, and the devil himself was saying, I'm going to get you to sin. I'm going to destroy you. I'm, you're, I mean, you're going to stop you. I'm going to stop you. And it, you know, submitted him to mockery, and to torture, and abandonment, and betrayal, and every last thing at the very end. Then it killed him. And that was all that, that was the final, final card in the deck for death. Death killed him. And yet, death wasn't enough. Death couldn't hold him. So the power was fully expended and it wasn't enough to stop him. Life prevailed, and now we get to share in that because he took on our nature. Again, you find this in the New Testament too. In Colossians, Paul says, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them. One translation says it put him to shame, put all these powers to shame, triumphing over them by the cross. So we have this victory cry, Christus Victor. Or in 1 Corinthians 15, a famous passage, when the perishable, the corruptible, has been clothed with the imperishable and mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? And where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's like a battle march through a dark territory, a victory cry in a dark world. As we're getting ready to wrap up, uh, I have one more quote from Athanasius. Um, you can't stop me. Uh, <laughs> he's, he's really good. Uh, he says, He, the life of all, our Lord and Savior, accepted and bore upon the cross a death inflicted by others, a death which to them was supremely terrible and by no means to be faced. And he did this in order that, by destroying even this death, he might himself be believed to be life and the power of death be recognized as finally destroyed. Death dies. So with the little time we have left, I want us to consider something very essential. Now, nothing of what I've said so far will matter at all. If you like the academic stuff and you like the facts, uh, it'll be of great value to you to incorporate those. If not, then at the very least, please listen to this. <laughs> the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is not merely some historical event that we study because it's interesting or that we can get some themes and helpful tips for life for. It is the great offense of all the ages. It is the stumbling block of the whole world, the turning point of history. And if you truly wish to understand what Jesus' life was about, as a Christian or not, what his death meant as well, you have to see yourself implicated in them. You have to see yourself implicated in the life and death of Jesus Christ. Jesus came for me, and he came for you. 
Love descended into our world, and it took on a face. And we killed him. Me, you might ask? But Jesus lived, he lived 2,000 years ago. I don't have anything to do with his death. And yet, even as you say the words, perhaps in your heart, there's a part of you that knows that had you been there, as he was spat on, as he was mocked and tortured, it wouldn't have been alongside him. So one Scottish hymn writer wrote, "'Twas I that shed the sacred blood. I nailed him to the tree. I crucified the Christ of God. I joined the mockery. Of all that shouting multitude, I feel that I am one. And in that din of voices rude, I recognize my own. Around the cross, the throng I see, they're mocking the sufferer's groan. It's still my voice, it seems to be, as if I mocked alone. We know that, in a sad way, this is no world for love. We know it because we've all made compromises with lovelessness. We've done it for expediency. There's a, there's a twist or a contradiction in our human life that means that we build a world that's unfit for humans. The only way to get by in it is to restrict your humanity rather carefully, because otherwise you get hurt. You have to ration your love and keep a wary eye out for enemies if you want to survive. Now, Jesus didn't ration his love. So naturally, he didn't last. But Jesus came to put an end to that way of living. To believe in the cross is to believe that this challenge to the world at the cost of destruction is not only right, but it's the key to what human life is about. That in this act, we have the revelation of the divine, nothing less. This strength through weakness, it comes out in Revelations where it's declared of Jesus, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain. This scroll that symbolizes the whole meaning and the whole purpose of history that nobody else can open. You are worthy because you were slain and with your blood purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Sacrifice is the key to the great mysteries of our destiny. Jesus said in John 14, Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. Now what kind of a man could make that promise? Other than the one who had let death exhaust itself against him to prove that he holds eternal life. And that wasn't just something that Jesus did for us. He did it so that we could now do it with him. That's why Paul can say, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer yourselves as living sacrifices. Because of the great sacrifice of Christ, our sacrifice has meaning now. Our sacrifice, we can follow him in that path that leads not at the end of death, but that through death to life. Holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. Don't conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You know, there's just two kinds of death that you can die in this world. You get a pick. There's the death that, like Christ's death, is the operation of the spirit, or the death that means simply that the organism has ceased to function. To die as Christ did is to conquer death. Death then becomes simply the beginning of the great transformation of the resurrection. But that would be another sermon. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we've prayed for your Holy Spirit to, to move among us, Lord, to illuminate our minds. Um, we know that we are not always at our best, and even at our best, we leave something big to be desired. I pray, God, that we would feel the reality of your love, that as tough as life seems, 
There's something very simple in it all. Through all these theories and all these ways of talking about a God, perhaps there's some part of us that knows beyond words that your sacrifice did bring healing to the world. That life gets the final say. That love gets the final say. And that you've prepared a place for us, God, that is based on love, not just on survival. So I pray for everyone in this room, Christian or not, or young or old, whatever our backgrounds are, God, that you would speak to us where we're at. Strengthen us for this week. Allow us to bring eternity into the day and to walk with you moment by moment and allow you to carry us when we get a bit tired and have trouble walking. Lord, we ask this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That was beautiful.